as you've noticed from time to time, we've been sneaking some of our missionaries in and having kind of that missions moment. And today we get to do the same thing. Now, Wally, I said in the last hour, you didn't need many introductions. But in this hour, I'm guessing there are a few people that maybe are new to our church family or guests of ours. And so why don't you all take a moment, uh, Wally and Barbara Rendell. Now, let me say this because he won't. He was the pastor before I came, and he was here for six or seven years. And I tell people I've been riding their coattails. And then he was at Southern Acres for how many years were you all? 34 years at Southern Acres. So he's kind of a staple in the community. Yep, absolutely. And I call him like my father-in-law. I call him one of the master pastors. He's been doing it a long time. And young fellows like us, we kind of watch and we're, we're chasing after him. But we're glad to have you all here. Uh, you're here not because you're the preacher of the church prior to me. You're here because of Barbara and your ministry called Scattered Joy. So introduce yourself and tell us a little bit more about that ministry. Well, that's why we are here. And I want to give thanks to Lee, to you, and to Jessman Christian Church for your support for Scatter Joy. Mm -hmm. Joy is Barbara's favorite word. <laughs> and so in her heart was born a ministry called Scatter Joy. How can we turn the church inside out to take about those miracles we sang about mm -hmm. and move those out into the community? And so that's why Scatter Joy was born. It's a nonprofit. We don't take a salary and expenses or anything. It's just any funds that come, we just recycle it to meet needs in the community. For instance, the jail ministry was born through Scatter Joy. Mm -hmm. and the first uh, uh, jail ministry that we had, Barbara Burton, I think, is pictured there with yep. Barbara. And uh, over 700 have been baptized yeah. now. Did y'all hear that? It's amazing. It's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. 700, then, se 700 baptisms is a big deal. 700 it is, so it, it, yeah it continues and thank you so much and celebrate recovery was born out of that which meets every week yep. here. tuesday nights there's about 30 to 40 people every tuesday night men and women who come right here in our fellowship hall we have dinner and then we do celebrate recovery it's ran by one of our deacons brian spears but that was birthed again out of that scattered joy movement right thank you so much and the foreign missions we pack meals we packed over 100,000 meals and sent them to Haiti, Honduras, and Liberia. The lead. In June, we packed how many? 15,000 meals. We sent them to Liberia. We got word that they'll be there in October for a great ministry that Lee, Matt Lee uh, and, and Tate Creek Christian Church does. You know, when Ukraine happened, mm -hmm. then funds started coming in, and so we went and bought supplies, over $6,000 worth of supplies, and sent to Ukraine. During the pandemic, 2021, through Scattered Joy, 600 meals were prepared and were delivered to folk who couldn't get out, wouldn't get out, were scared to get out, and we took them to their doorstep, and many of you helped us, helped us do that, 500 backpacks. Uh, we have gathered, and for Jessamine County, and for Selman Fayette County. Most recently, you've heard of the Galilean home down mm -hmm. at Liberty. That's right. Children's home. Mm -hmm. It is a marvelous ministry. So in uh, a few months back, we took a big load down to uh, Liberty, to the Galilean home. Folk here in the church helped us do that. Two truckloads of material. And then here came the flood. Oh my, and it's just incredible what has happened in Eastern Kentucky. And so folk have been coming through Scatter Joy. How can we help? Resources, and by the way, we tell people don't ever give your tithe to Scatter Joy. It belongs to the church. <laughs> and so we don't ever encourage that. But people, you know, have abundance. Sure. So over and above, monies have come in, $17,000. We've loaded two truckloads. We go down to Sam's Club. Three truckloads, excuse me. That's why Barbara's up here. Make sure he gets it right. It's actually four truckloads. That's a preacher's count. That's right. We always round up. Four, four truckloads. But anyway, uh, $17,500, if you can believe. And we, the last one left on Wednesday. And Barbara and I, we still have a pulse, so we still got a purpose. Mm -hmm. And if you got a pulse... You got a purpose. That's right. And we're just praying the Lord will help us. Now let me just wrap this up. 
by pointing out, by the way, these notes are out in the lobby. Mm -hmm. You can pick them up and Barbara's contact information. We had somebody at the first service work and came and said, who was that lady? Who'd she work with? Oh, with um, Toys for, uh, through the fire department? Yeah, uh -huh. through the fire department. And she said, I want to get Sarah Joy involved in that. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be involved in that. Now then, August 23rd, which is Tuesday, we're doing the meal for the Celebrate Recovery and the message. September 18th, one month from now, we've invited all of Revive House, the addiction recovery here in Nicholasville, to mm -hmm. come to church mm -hmm. right here. And after that, we're going to have a meal back there for them, and we're going to give them all kinds of gifts. And you can help us get those gifts, underwear, socks, toiletries, winter gloves, blankets, quilts, Bibles. You can get the information back at, at the lobby. October 1, we're going to do a meal packing and Jessamine Christian Church is letting us have it right here. It's a Saturday, and we pack how many? Probably 25,000 meals this time? We did the last time. Okay, last time, 25,000 meals, and we have folk from the church that say, I'll give a Saturday morning and help with the meal packing. Mm -hmm. So we invite you to get involved. We're going to do free oil changes the next weekend, and uh, yeah, for, for widows and single moms, and then on December the 3rd, we're going to do caroling gifts over at Sayre Christian Village. So simple, let me close by saying, if you're not dead, you're not done. Mm -hmm. And that God has not saved us to boss, God saved us to serve. We're not saved by works, but we are saved to work and to serve and to care and to take these miracles we sang about out to the community. Yeah, absolutely. Again, Thank you, Lee. Yeah. Adjustment Christian Church. We're glad you're here. And the community, our church, and even the kingdom, you know, are different because of the work that you all are doing. And I know that you all don't do this on your own. A lot of our church family and other churches in the community come along and partner and serve. And so we, we just thank you all for kind of spearheading that. And by, by spearheading, I'm really talking about Barbara. Wally's got the mic, but Barbara is, she's a stick of dynamite. Like, get out of the way. If she's on a mission, she's going to get it done. And we're thankful for that enthusiasm and passion for, for life and serving and giving. So let me pray for you all and scatter joy, and then we'll keep moving here. Father in heaven, I thank you for today, Lord. Just a, a moment to be mindful. There is so much going on in our community, and there's a lot of needs. And Father, you've tapped the, show, the church on the shoulder to meet those needs. And Amen. so there is no plan B, Lord. We are plan A, and I just ask that you would help us to serve faithfully. We thank you for Wally and Barbara and their many friends that help organize these acts of service, Lord. And thank you for the partnership we have with them. Just continue to love on them and run ahead and prepare the way for whatever's next. Lord. And we love you and we thank you in Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank, thank you. you. Absolutely. Well, if you're a guest of ours, last week we kicked off a new study. We're going through Ecclesiastes. We have some of these journals. Uh, we gave some of these away, and if you're still looking for them, there's a QR code in the foyer that you can just jump online and have one of these shipped to your house. They're like five bucks. And we are spending an, an entire semester going through the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes is kind of like a journal that Solomon has written for us. And so we're, we're studying through Ecclesiastes. All kinds of subject matter, life, death, time, work, prosperity, worship, all of these things, friendships, all of these things are referenced in the story uh, in the journal that Solomon has written. So last week we began by looking about what Solomon had to say about life. And I don't know who said it, but I believe it's true. Sunday reminds us of heaven and Monday reminds us we're not there yet. Amen. Isn't that what it looks like? That's the truth. Sunday reminds us of heaven, and Monday reminds us, what is it? We're not there yet. That's the series, that's the title of this. You can see it on the screen there. Not there yet. And so what do we have to continue to learn? Not only about life, that was last, last week's message. You can jump online if you missed it. But also, this week, what does he say about death? Um, did you know that thinking about death can actually make you a wise person. Solomon was known as the wisest man in the Old Testament. And so 
This is why the wisest man in the Old Testament was also the wisest man who thought about death more than anybody else. I can't think of anyone in the Scripture who talks about death more than Solomon. And you're getting ready to see that out. If you're taking notes, we're going to cover a lot of Scriptures today. So if you have your Bibles, you can go to Ecclesiastes. It's in the Old Testament. It's one of the books of uh, poetry. And I'm going to start in chapter 7, but it may be good that you're writing these down, that you can read them throughout the week, because like I said, we are going to cover a lot of them. But Ecclesiastes chapter 7, it says, It's better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting, for this is the end of all mankind, and the living will lay it to heart. Now, that's a translation from the English Standard Version, which is the journals that we're using. But I have a few different scripture references, and the one that I like better is translated in the New Living Bible. And in the New Living Bible, this is what that same scripture says. It's better to spend your time at funerals than at festivals, for you are going to die, and you should think about it while there's still time. Isn't that a good translation? Hey, it's better to spend your time at funerals. When I said that to someone a while back, they're like, that's not true. That can be true. It's better to think about funerals and festivals. Yeah, because they cause us to think about life above the sun. Solomon's journal forces us to deal with the reality of death. And so we're going to discover when we view death under the sun that it's going to be pretty discouraging. But we know that there's the hope of heaven above the sun. Don't miss the difference. If you're looking at death from a worldly perspective, it is very discouraging and depressing. I don't know how people go to funerals. If you don't have the hope of heaven and life above the sun, then yeah, I can see why this would be discouraging and depressing. But remember that phrase, under the sun. You're going to hear it all through the semester. 32 times Solomon uses this phrase, under the sun. And on every occasion, it speaks to the secular, the worldly point of view. And so if you're taking notes, jot a few things down here. Solomon says, he's talking about death, death viewed under the sun. And he says, death is cruel. Jot that down. He's almost bitter when he vents about nothing under the sun is going to survive death. In fact, he says it's better to be wise than to be foolish. But at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter because everybody has the same fate. So look at Ecclesiastes chapter 2. That's about where we left off last week. Chapter 2, verse 15 and 16. He says, Then I said in my heart, What happens to the fool will also happen to me. You know, he's the wisest man, wise and foolish. Same fate. And in my heart that this also is vanity. It's meaningless. Verse 16, the text says, For the wise, as the fool, there is no enduring remembrance, seeing that in the days to come all will have been long forgotten. How the wise dies just like the fool. Folks, Solomon is bitter about this death under the sun, and he just keeps on writing. There are so many scriptures. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, he says, It's the same for all of us the, uh, since, since the same events happen to the righteous and to the wicked. The same events happen to the good as it does the evil. The same events happen to the clean as it does the unclean. And then verse 3, it says, And this is an evil in all that is done under the sun, that the same events happen to everyone. And then the last of that text, it says, and after that, all those same events that happen to everyone, and after that, they all go to the dead. Same. Solomon saying death makes foolish all this stuff that we get bent out of shape of. Think about all the arguments. Think about all the news channels. Think about all the conflicts and all the controversy. Doesn't matter, he says. If you're rich or you're poor, if you're black or you're white, if you're Republican or you're a Democrat, if you're a capitalist or a socialist, guess what? The same's going to happen. All of us are going to die. And so it's in this bitterness of death that Solomon is writing. And he goes as far to say, if you can believe it or not, 
he doesn't even see a lot of difference between animals and people. Now, that sounds like heresy, but turn to chapter 3 and see it for yourself. For what happens to the children happens to the beast. Same. <coughs> Just so you know. <coughs> but sinuses are getting the best of me. What happens to children happens to the beast. Same. They all have the same breath. Man has no advantages, even over the beast. All of it is, and what's the word? Vanity, meaningless, worthless. That term vanity, when you read it in your translation, a better translation is vapor or a mere breath. The word is best translated temporary. So for what happens to children happens to the beast, it's the same. They all have the same breath. They're all temporary. They all go to one place. All are from the dust, and guess what? From the dust, everyone returns. Now, that sounds like heresy, and why in the world does the Bible even include this? You have to remember, last week I said Ecclesiastes is a description of secularism, of a life that's lived under the sun, a worldly life. Here's the best way to think of it, life without God. That's how he's writing Ecclesiastes, life without God. If all you see is life on this earth, and you never see life lived above the sun, the hope of heaven and eternity, then where is it that you would find meaning and hope? If your only view of death is under the sun, how, how can you not be a cynic? Mark Twain, probably America's best-known secularist, worldly perspective, before he died, this is what he wrote. It could have almost come right out of Solomon, but listen. A myriad of men are born. They labor, sweat, and struggle. They squabble and scold and fight. They scramble for little mean advantages over each other. Age creeps upon them. Affirmative follows. Those they love are taken from them. The joy of life turned to aching grief. Death comes at last. The only unpoisoned gift they were of no consequence. A world that will lament them a day and forget them forever. Folks, if you can't deal with death, then why is life a big deal? If there's nothing more to life. If death is cruel, we just live and we die and that's it. Well then yeah, life does have no meaning. Jot that down. If death is cruel, he said it is. If we just live and die and that's it, then life has no meaning. No hope of heaven. There's no meaning without that. What does it matter how you play the cards that you've been dealt if no matter how you play the cards, you still get trumped at the end? This is what he's saying. In Ecclesiastes 6 and verse 6, he says, He might live a thousand years twice and over, but still not find contentment. And since he must die like everyone else, well, what's the use? And so when you think of a worldly perspective and what they teach in our colleges and universities, folks, the humanist is intellectually dishonest to say that we're just a few billion years of evolution in a matter of time and chance, and then you die and it's over. It's dishonest for them to say that, and then to tell us life has meaning and purpose. Where's the worth? if we're just that little cosmic explosion that happened a few billion years ago. Folks, in our universities, these secularists, they tell us the, the way that life matters is if you leave something behind. They even have a word for it. They call it the immorality of achievement. That I'm going to accomplish these things, and they will live after me. Well, if you read enough of Solomon, you learn real quick, he's not going to have any of that. He doesn't agree with that. That the purely human achievements that we call lasting are nothing of the kind. That after we die, they will forget us, and we forget those who died before us. Remember last week's question? How many of you know your great-great-grandmother's maiden name? Does anybody, did anybody go home? Anybody hit Ancestry.com? Anybody? 
Nobody. See, okay, thank you. One person, two people, three people. I'm just, I'm just seeing hands go. But my grandma Jenny May, who lives over in Versailles, did. Her maiden name was Evans. She lived on Frankfurt Street right across from the high school. I had to call my dad and ask. That's the point. We do forget. Time moves on. In Ecclesiastes chapter 2 and verse 16, he says, For the wise and the foolish, they both die. The wise will not be remembered any longer than the fool. In the days to come, both will be forgotten. Stephen Hawkins, you've seen him. You know him as a brilliant scientist. And he wrote a book called A Brief History of Time. And as a secularist, he has the honest question, why does the universe go to bother of existing? Isn't that a good question? Why does the universe go to the bother of existing? Why? And I'll say it again. If your view of life can't deal with death, then why is life so important? We have to deal with death for life to matter. The irony of it all is Solomon actually, as depressing as he may be, he actually values life and the importance of life. And to Solomon, life did mean something. And so let me show you how. We looked at death and its view under the sun. Now look, let's look at life viewed under the sun. And the first thing Solomon says, jot this down. He says, death is real. Life under the sun, yes, but death is real. George Bernard Shaw agreed with Solomon when he said the stats on death are quite impressive. One out of one, one out of one die. Every one of us, right? Nobody can argue those stats. And Solomon agrees with all of the rest of the Bible that challenges us to deal with the finite future of this life. And so when you read Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 4, he writes... A wise person thinks a lot about death, while the fool only thinks about having a good time. Folks, Solomon isn't recommending that we have a morbid view or perspective of death. He's recommending we have an honest attitude and perspective about death. That he realizes that all of us are working our way toward that goal. That all of us have a terminal disease. Every one of us have it, and it's called life. If you're alive today, guess what? You've got a terminal disease, and it ends in death. But if we're going to die, Solomon says, then we ought to live well. And there's some hope for you. There's a little smile on this discussion. It's pretty heavy when you're talking about death. But if we're going to live life, we should live life well. And here's how. Psalm 90 and 2, it says, Teach us to number our days, that we may get a heart of wisdom. Ecclesiastes 3, verse 11, it's the key verse to the whole book of Ecclesiastes. That in God's time, he made everything beautiful. And the scripture says, he planted eternity in the heart of man, the hope of heaven. Folks, I know you won't believe it, but I turned 51 this past spring. Even if I live to be 100 years old, I'm already halfway done, right? My cousin is John Conley. He used to sing country music back in the 70s and 80s, and he wrote a song. I'm on the back side of 30 and uh, anybody? The short side of time. And that's the truth. That's every one of us. Uh, if you... If you think you're fooling yourself, I know we can have cosmetic surgery, and I know we can have, uh, take all the vitamins under the sun. I know that we can color our hair all kinds of different shades. But the truth is that since about the age of 35, every time you walk by the mirror, the illusion that you are working yourself towards death is right there. The proof is in the mirror, folks. The mirror does not lie. And this is where Solomon takes a pleasant, kind of an unexpected turn. He says, if death is real, then living well should be a priority. Solomon does not have an answer for death, but it frustrates him because he is definitely and thoroughly pro-life. Living well should be a priority. He says, if we're going to die, so... We need to do all the living that we can. 
Now, can I just qualify? There's good ways of living, and there's bad ways of living, and there's wise ways of living, and there are foolish ways of living. This isn't a, a, a green light. What then shall we continue in sin that grace may increase? By no means. It's not, that's not the green light that we're talking about here. Solomon is saying if we're living, if we're going to die, then we should live so well by enthusiastically pursuing the joy that God gives us in our everyday living. Jesus said, I came to give you life and life abundantly, life unto the fullest. Let me show you what he's talking about. Jot these down because it's all the way through the book. But in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, he says, So I decided there is nothing better than to enjoy food and drink and find satisfaction in hard work. Then I realized food and drink and hard work, these pleasures are from the hand of God. Did you realize that? Good things, blessings in life, cowboy ribeyes, those are pleasures from the hand of God, hard work. Chapter 2 says that. In chapter 3 he says, So I concluded... There's nothing better than to be happy and to enjoy ourselves as long as we can. That people should eat and drink and enjoy the fruits of their labor. And here it is again, bold, highlighting my text. For these are the gift of God. So I have noticed one thing. Eat, drink, and have a good glass of wine and enjoy their work under the sun. Chapter 8, so I recommend, are you catching this? I decided, I concluded, I have noticed, I recommend having fun because there is nothing better for people in this world to do than to eat and drink and enjoy life. And he says, these are the gifts of God. These are the pleasures of God. These are good things when done right. I hope you're getting the picture here. Solomon is saying, none of us are going to get out of this world alive. And so if you're going to have a party, have it today, right? Don't put it off. Don't delay. We don't know what tomorrow looks like. If you're going to have a party, have it today. Eat and drink and enjoy God's blessings. Now, Ecclesiastes is in the Old Testament. I don't know how many times y'all have looked at the Old Testament, how often you read through it. But can I just tell you this? Spoiler alert. Nowhere in the Old Testament does it say it's a sin to have fun. Did you know that? All those commandments, all those rules, all those regulations. Nowhere in the Old Testament does it say that it's wrong to enjoy life. When I was a kid growing up, it looked like everybody in my church had been baptized in vinegar. And they just sit there like that. (laughs) They dared the preacher to make me smile. I dare you. And where do we come up with that in the church? Where do we get that idea that life shouldn't be enjoyed? Solomon says, hey... We're all going to die. So start living now. Tell some good jokes. Throw a party. Maybe instead of watching football all day on the couch, get your family and your kids and your neighbors and go out and play a big old game of touch football or tackle football. Have fun. Watch the sunset. Please, somebody eat some pecan pie. (laughs) Right? That's a paraphrase, but that's what I'm getting out of this. You turn over the page from chapter 8 to chapter 9, and Solomon says, Go ahead, eat your food with joy. Drink your wine and with a happy heart. And here it is, bold and underlined, for God approves of this. Jesus came, said, I came to give you life and abundant life and to the fullest. Why do we not have good times? Can I give you two reasons? Maybe one of these will hit you. Why don't we have a better time? Why don't we enjoy life to the fullest? Number one is nostalgia. I am guilty of this. Since I have been home back in Kentucky, my kids, my family, and probably the staff have all heard me say, boy, back in the day, and when I was at Woodford County, when I was at Versailles, and when we went down on the river, and I tell all my stories, but we live in nostalgia. And some of us are missing the joy today because we keep longing for the good old days. Boy, I wish things were like they were when I was a kid growing up. Kids today, they don't know what it's like to drink from a garden hose. And when I weed-eated all the horse farms in Midway, I had forearms that looked like Popeye because I would weed-eat all day and every... Kids don't know what it's like to work on the farm. Are you with me? Do you ever say these things? Our country was better back then. Our schools were better back then. Our church was way better back then. 
And we say these things. And Solomon has a word for you. If you live in nostalgia, go to chapter 7 and verse 10. And I'm reading from the New Living Translation here. Solomon says, don't long for those good old days. It's not wise. Folks, you're missing the joy of today if you're living in your past. Let me give you one more and I'll keep moving back to the message here. Some of you are missing the joy of today because of forecasting. Boy, as soon as I get this, as soon as I get that, as soon as this is paid off, as soon as I graduate, as soon as I get that promotion, as soon as I get that pay raise, if we hadn't had six kids in five years, and we're forecasting, as soon as we become empty nesters, then I'm really going to enjoy life. And you're missing the joy of today because you're just wishing it away and forecasting and waiting. Solomon has a word for you. Go to chapter 11 and verse 4. Solomon, this is in the Living Bible. He says, if you're waiting for perfect conditions, if, when, if you're waiting for perfect conditions, you'll never get anything done. Folks, if you have a dream, go for it. If you have somebody to love, hug them tight today. Don't wait. If you have a goal, live for that. Live hard. Life is hard. My hero is a guy by the name of S.L. Potter. I've never met him. He's from California. But on his 100th birthday, he declared he was going bungee jumping. His kids at the age of 68 and 74 told him it wasn't a wise thing to do. But he declared it, and sure enough, on his 100th birthday, he climbed a 210-foot tower, and he bungee jumped successfully to the ground. My favorite part of the whole story. You know what his first words were when his kids came up to him after he landed on the ground? Give me my teeth back. <laughs> Isn't that funny? That's the very first thing. I, Give me my teeth back. I love it. That is great. Some of you are talking on your cell phone while you're texting on your phone, while you're driving through the drive through at the whatever place, to get your burger and fries to scarf it down because you're in such a hurry. And Solomon says, no, stop doing that. Savor the meal. Enjoy your work. Cherish your family. Have some pecan pie, people. <laughs> Jim Elliott, who was killed for his faith, and he was a martyred missionary, he said, wherever you are, be all there. Live to the hilt, every situation that you believe to be the will of God. If God says do it, do it, and do it to the fullest, and live it to the hilt. Wherever you are, be all there. Folks, some of y'all are eating brand cereal in the mornings, and you're working out four times a week, and you probably gave up smoking a good cigar, and there's nothing wrong with any of those things. But my question is, why would you add years to your life if you're not going to add life to your years. Live it to the fullest. This is the day that God has made. We are called to rejoice and to be glad in it. Now, as we're preparing for a time of decision and continued worship, can I just say this? We can do better than Solomon, right? We, we can do better than Solomon because we know something that Solomon didn't know. The Bishop Warren Candler from whom the Candler School of Theology at Emory University, if you've heard of the school, Emory University, his name is on the building. You get it? And when he was near death, a friend stopped by and said, Bishop, would you tell me the truth? Do you fear crossing over the river of death? And the bishop said, why should I? My father owns the land on both sides of the river. And isn't that a great perspective? And isn't that true? That he knew that, the bishop knew that, because he knew Jesus. And he had a hope of heaven. Folks, Solomon, when he's writing in his journal, he's only qualified to talk about death from under the sun, from this side of the river. But Jesus is qualified to talk about death and life both. And so in Hebrews chapter 2, you read the scripture. And it says, because God's children are human beings, us, made of flesh and blood, then the Son, Jesus, also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil, who had the power of death, had the power of death. 
And only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. We do not have to be afraid. We do not grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We have hope. Revelation chapter 1, it says, I, Jesus, I am the living one. I died, but look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys to death and to the grave. Folks, we can do better than Solomon because we know what Solomon did not know. That the gospel declares that life and death are under the sun, S-O-N, life and death are under the sun of God, Jesus. And he controls the keys to life and death. And death no longer triumphs life. Death no longer has the last word. And this is why we should be able to suck all of the morrow out of every day that God has given to us. And like Peter, we could say, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's by His great mercy that we have been born again because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And now we live with great expectation. Folks, you know what that expectation is? It's the hope of heaven. It's for those of us who've been united with Christ in baptism. We're also united with Christ in celebrating the resurrection and the power over death. And the decision is yours. Every one of you in this room have to make a decision. Are you living and dying under the sun from a worldly perspective? Or are you living and dying under the sun, Jesus Christ? The way you answer the question determines how you live your life. Father, I just pray now. So thankful for this little journal called Ecclesiastes. So thankful that the Bible is honest. That if the Bible was just a work of men, the books like Ecclesiastes would have been forgotten. But you want us to face the hard questions like death and life and meaning and purpose. The kinds of questions that we want to hide in the basement and ignore. That, Lord, you want us to look at death in the face and ask ourselves, do we have the answers for the hard questions? And the answer, Lord, we find in the Son, Jesus. And I pray today that you would give us a greater passion to embrace the short life that we do have, to live every day to the hilt, to enjoy all the unnecessary joys that you have given us and the many blessings you pour out on our life every day. Father, this is only possible through Jesus, and we pray in his name. Amen.